So you've watched James' excellent presentation, you've read the blog, and you're probably wondering, what next? How can I get started with this? Um, the presentation which you're about to see is just one way of you get really getting into uh, facial recognition at a relatively low cost. So, um, over to you, William. Uh, just to check, are you seeing my presentation and me, I suppose? Sorry, yes. Good, then I, then I will proceed. Yes, so this work was, uh, this is facial recognition on Google's HTPU. Um, so this was a project that uh, Ember Cousin pursued largely in the direction of uh, getting teenagers interested in AI and to try to do this in a way that's sort of intellectually stimulating instead of making AI um, sort of this magic thing uh, where things happen. Um, and uh, credit where credit's due, I am not a teenager, though I know I look very young and beautiful. Um, the two people who actually worked on this project were Pietra and Lewis, two of our uh, younger engineers. Pietra especially did almost all of the work here. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't be here that day to present, so I'm doing it instead. Um, anyway, so the structure of this talk, I, I know you, some of the audience may not perhaps be exceptionally familiar with uh, the neural networks that we applied a lot here. So I'm first going to go over a little bit of neural network theory. I'm then going to cover at least an approach to um, facial recognition, how a sort of facial recognition pipeline might work uh, in reality. And then I'll talk about how we sort of married these two things together. So how we applied neural networks to face recognition. Um, so first bit of neural network uh, theory, the sort of intuition behind neural networks. And the intuition behind neural networks is that many small individually simple units can come together to create incredibly complicated behavior. A simple, you know, a, a, an individual unit in a neural network is a neuron sort of analogously to the neurons um, in my head, for example. Um, and they can be, they're just very simple uh, functional units. So in this example on this slide, my neuron is simply taking a bunch of inputs. It's weighting them differently. That's what the, uh, the Ws are. It's applying some function to those and it's just then outputting it to anybody who listens. You can achieve a lot, well, you can achieve a surprising amount with an individual neuron, but the sort of magic happens when you combine a lot of them together. A very common way to do this is to put neural networks together into layers where each neuron in each layer is connected to each neuron in each subsequent layer, um, but not to the neurons in the same layer. Um, a picture says a thousand words, and this is probably better than my explanation. Um, so it's all very well to say that and to sort of get to get to to say that this complicated behavior arises, but a, it's probably better to sort of give an intuition as to why this happens. It's easy to say lots of simple units come together to create complicated behavior, but how does that actually work? So a simple intuition here is I have hand drawn this terrible function here. Um, it's it would be quite a horrible function to approximate by just sort of throwing polynomials at it to try and work out what fits best. But actually, if we just put a bunch of simple straight lines together, a bunch of simple linear functions, we can approximate the function quite well. And that is, you know, that is a way of thinking about what the neural network is really doing under the hood. A lot of individual simple units are coming together to create complicated behavior. A thing worth saying is that if we are willing for our individual units, our neurons, to be more complicated themselves, I will probably need less of them to do any given task. So here I've tried to use uh, simple curves instead of straight lines to approximate the line, and it was it was much easier to do. I needed far fewer. Um, yes. So that's an intuition as to how the neural network sort of functions in a sense, as to how the neural network can achieve complicated things. But the question is, how do I take this framework and then, you know, actually, actually make it do that for something useful? How do I adapt my neural network structure to be what I want it to be? A way of doing, well, a very common way of doing that is with backpropagation. And backpropagation is basically just a simple credit blame assignment system. Um, and so in backpropagation, the amount that a neuron contributes to a correct or incorrect solution 
corresponds to how much it is rewarded or penalized uh, for, for, for that. So the, the intuition here is that I feed some things into my neural network, see what come out, see what comes out. And if it's correct, I reward it. And if it's incorrect, I penalize it. So simple example here, I have three neurons feeding into a correct answer. I have lines of varying thickness corresponding to how much they each contributed to that correct answer. And then what back propagation will do is it will, will proportionally reward them by how much they contributed. So the, you know, the bottom one that contributed a lot to that correct solution is upweighted a lot. And the top one, which didn't contribute much, is, is barely upweighted at all. Similar thing, the sim, a similar thing applies for my incorrect solution. So in this case, I've got it wrong and I want to penalize my neural network because it's, you know, it's done the wrong thing. In this case, I penalize my uh, very my bottom neuron very heavily because it contributed a lot to this failure, and I don't do so much to be able to do because they didn't contribute so much. And by doing this many many times, back propagation forces the neural network to organize itself around well around what you want it to do. So if we go back a few slides by increasing the weights of correct solutions. I then make my neural network be more correct in future. And by repeating this many, many times, the, the network organizes itself to come to the solution I'm trying to get to the ball. So this gets a little bit more complicated when we have many neurons. Obviously, this example is nice and simple, but when we've got a large number of interconnected neurons in multiple layers, we, you know, back propagation becomes a bit more complicated. Um, and in general, what I will do in this situation is that I will sort of order the back propagation for one layer out at once, and then I will propagate that error back to the layer before that, and so on and so forth. An interesting facet of this in neural networks in general, particularly larger, longer neural networks with more hidden layers, is that neurons earlier in the uh, network, closer to the input, won't contribute so much to the final output, and so this back propagation algorithm won't penalize or reward them very much. Um, and so in order to affect any reasonable changes to these, I will need a lot of, you know, I will need to do this many, many, many times, um, possibly a prohibitive number. Um, and, and we call this the vanishing gradient problem and the deep learning that a lot of people talk about is basically largely attempts to solve this problem. Um, but anyway, that, that was just a little aside. So that's hopefully largely covered some key neural network uh, theory and at least giving an intuition as to why they are useful tools and why everybody raves about them so much i suppose um, next i'm going to try and cover the basics behind face recognition or at least a way that face recognition works i'm sure you could make it work other ways if you wanted to and the way we're going to do this is we're going to take a exemplar picture here, uh, which I have here, and we're going to look at how we would take the faces out of this and, and you know, try and identify the people inside them. Um, I did pick this picture for a reason. It's quite a nice example in many ways. Um, so the step zero, the sort of step you should consider, well, I'm not even sure if it really counts as a step. The, step you, the thing you should perhaps consider before everything else is, does my picture have any faces in it? And you can check this, perhaps it's an assumption that you can make because you know that you're only gonna ever be given pictures that have faces in them. But it, it, it's a thing that's very much worth considering um, before you go on to any other steps. Because obviously if your, face has, if your picture has no faces in it, then there's not really any point doing facial, facial recognition. So I have this picture. I want to identify the people in this picture. So the very first step is to, oh dear, he's gone rather out of line. The very first step is to identify where the faces in the picture are. And the important thing here is that's all I'm doing. I'm just trying to find where the faces are. At this stage, the faces are probably going to be different sizes. They're going to be different orientations, such as the lovely chap lying on the floor there is oriented rather differently to everybody else. And in general, my, you know, in general, I'm only solving one problem here. I'm just finding where the faces are. That's, that's my first step. 
My second step is to transform these faces into a uniform input, you know, to, to provide the best possible chance for my latent steps to fairly treat each individual face um, as possible. So here I will orient the faces, I will resize them to all be the same size, I will perhaps mess with the contrast of the pictures to make sure that there's you know enough contrasting pixels to make a reasonable inference and so on and so forth. Finally, once I've done this, I do the uh, probably what most people would call the difficult bit, which is creating an embedding of the faces, basically extracting the features from the faces so that I can make a sensible inference about them. So if I, if you or I look at a face, we will see features like perhaps you'd see my eye height, uh, how high my eyes up are my head, how high my eyes are on my head as a, as a key feature to identify me as me. But, I, I, and this is an analogy to what's being done here. It, the, you know, we're trying to extract features from the faces, but very often they won't be human recognizable features. You know, these features will be chosen by, probably chosen by some machine learning algorithm to be the features that give them the best results. And so they'll probably tend to be things like um, lines or particularly notable, you know, particularly notable patches of pixels um, and so on and so forth. Um, but the important thing here is that I'm taking my sort of difficult, you know, difficult structure that is uh, an image in RGB and converting it to a vector of numbers that I can then practically do stuff with in a mathematical sense. And once I have that vector of numbers, things are rather easy. I basically take my vector of numbers, um, stick it into my favorite machine learning algorithm, machine learning happens, and then I get an answer out. That's just a, you know, you, you just, you can just deploy whichever of your favorite algorithms you would like here and, uh, and get the solution. So, that, so hopefully now we have covered at least the basic intuition behind what neural networks are doing, and we have covered the basic intuition behind how a facial recognition pipeline might work. So now I'm going to talk about what, what, what we have done. Um, and what we have done is that we have taken the, we, we have taken some specialized hardware at like Google's Edge TPU, and we have tried to build an, a, a facial recognition pipeline largely supported or, well, hopefully eventually entirely on uh, this TPU. Um, the reason we want to do this is because a motivation for using specialized hardware in this case like the TPU is that neural network operations require a lot of very specialized, uh, well, they require a lot of processing power and use a lot of very specialized particular operations um, when they're being trained or when they're doing inference. So it's very beneficial to use specialized hardware for this, it makes things go quicker. Um, so where open source comes into this is that actually the TPU and nearly everything associated with it uh, is entirely open source. So TensorFlow, which uh, since you know Google, uh, Google's baby is TensorFlow, uh, um, the Edge TPU works with, uh, is largely open source. The um, a lot of the machine learning AI libraries that we'd wish to learn are open source in Python, so on and so forth. Um, so as I, I have been explicitly saying mostly open here, obviously the specific hardware specification of the TPU itself is, uh, is somewhat closed, as are some of the details in TensorFlow about how stuff is compiled and in the architecture presumably to keep that. So not quite everything is open here, nearly everything is. Um, so we have taken this hard, we have taken this HTPU hardware and we have tried to implement, influence a face detection pipeline on this hardware. But we are somewhat limited with what we can do with this TPU. So one thing we can't do is we can't train our neural network on the TPU. We'll have to train it off the TPU and then bring that trained model onto the TPU. Um, training it is frankly difficult and this small piece of hardware doesn't support it well. So it's, it's simply not practical to do. In terms of our facial recognition pipeline, at the moment, we are only doing two steps of our five possible steps, I suppose, or at least the five ones that I um, proposed on the TPU. So we are leaving detection, localization, and transformation 
as things to be done off the GPU, sort of on our um, on our large machines, um, and then we are feeding the GPU only the you know the properly transformed unified bases for embedding and then classification. Though uh, we will make some small changes to that later. Um, if you're wondering how this sort of practically works, broadly, you take your you take your favorite TensorFlow model, you drain it, you then export it to a particular format the HTPU likes. This gets compiled down, stick it on your TPU, the TPU does its magic and works for you. So we have this specialized hardware, we know which steps we're doing on the TPU and which steps we're doing off of the TPU. How do we proceed from here? So the first thing is that we needed a trained model that we could, you know, that we could put onto the TPU to then do stuff with. Um, the easiest thing for us to do in this case, and what we did, was to take a pre-trained um, model for, I think, object classification in this case, that we knew would work on the TPU, and then retrain it to work on faces. Uh, and we did this with the Cassio web-based data set. There's, uh, it's a pretty large data set, and certainly it was easily large enough for our purposes. Uh, and as I said, we didn't do this on the TPU board, we did this on one of our um, big build machines. Um, and it took a while, but it got um, and in this first iteration, the neural network was rewarded for, you know, we, we effectively trained the model to identify faces, this neural network to identify faces straight up. So it was effectively doing the embedding and the classification steps together. It, you know, it would create an embedding and then it would classify it based on that embedding. That um, would be one way to look at it. So this worked surprisingly well, well, perhaps unsurprisingly well, I suppose. Um, we were seeing about 70% testing accuracy, which was which was pretty good. Um, but the training the model in this way came with well came with at least one major problem was that the which was that the model really didn't generalize well to faces outside of the training set. And you know this isn't really very this isn't ideal. It would be it would be nice if our if we could train a facial recognition um, model that would work on faces not just inside our set but could easily be adapted to faces outside our set because it's, it's difficult to train models it takes a long time and we don't want adding them to be don't want adding faces to our set to be difficult um, and to solve this we used a technique called weight embedding so uh, essentially what this involved was training the network as before and then splitting the neural network at the point that he generated embeddings and then training a new classifier, which in our case, I actually believe was another very small neural network um, to classify based on the embeddings that the first network had generated. And the advantage of doing this is that the, that the first network is trained to generate general embeddings that work well, and the second network is trained to use these embeddings um, to do things. And because the second network or whatever you choose to do is much smaller, it's much easier to retrain the new data. Um, I believe we were, yes, so we were able to um, tentatively retrain our network on new identities and have it kind of work within five to ten samples, with five to ten samples of a new face, have it identify that person. Um, so more formal testing on that will be required in future to quantify exactly how well it has worked. Um, so that's about where we're at with this. I have talked a lot quicker than I intended to, so I went through this very quickly. I do apologize. Um, our, where we're looking to take this in future is that where, if we go back a few slides, where at the moment we're doing only a little bit of the whole face recognition pipeline on the TPU and frankly the, you know, the easy bit. It would be really nice if we could do just the whole thing. So, you know, have the GPU detect whether there's a face, have it pull that face out of the image, um, and, you know, have it uh, normalize that, transform it, and then, and then do classification on it, um, recognition on it. That would be that, that would be nice, and that would be something we'd like to shoot for, and something, and doing this in real time, perhaps with a um, connected camera would, uh, would be nice. That's, that's the direction we'd like to take this. Um, we'd also like to try and take advantage of this weight imprinting technique a bit more. Um, it would be nice if we could train our pipeline to take to take a new identity and very quickly learn about it and then apply that 
um, in the field very quickly. I said that the TPU wasn't really suited to learning, but actually I think that if you only need five or 10 iterations to learn a new identity, it probably could do that, which might provide a way of adding new identities to the model without, without going through the laborious process of training uh, again. Finally, you know, a, a common topic at the moment with neural networks is that they are biased. Um, something we particularly noticed in our data set was, uh, and something that many people have noticed before, is that dark, dark skin makes it very difficult to do accurate classification because of the lack of contrast in the picture. Um, I know Pietro is particularly keen to explore this and uh, the implications of this. Anyway, that is the end. Do we have any questions? Suppose we've done questions at the end, so that was a silly question. Right. Don't appear to be any questions. Suppose people can't. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're, we're doing the question section. Anyway, I shall, I shall hand back over to you. Okay, okay. I, I must confess, I haven't, I haven't quite figured out this questions widget box yet, but <laughs> it doesn't appear to have any questions. Okay, thanks for that, Will. Um, that brings us, I think, to the end of our session for the night. Uh, let me get this one back. Change presenter. And we might get our, yeah, okay. So we should have that back again. Yes, yes, this is what we're gonna talk about next. So I just like to thank our two presenters for their great talks this evening. I'd like to thank James. Uh, James Ferriman of Reading University and Will Jones of Embercosm. I thought they're two great talks and hopefully they will whet your appetite for more, in which case don't forget about blog post, uh, which you'll find on the uh, on our uh, website. So what have we got next? Okay, on the Thursday the 17th of September, we have a Women in Open Source meeting, which was uh, rescheduled from April and Thursday, the 15th of October, we're going to have a lightning talks evening and AGM. Uh, given the current COVID crisis, it's likely they will be online. Uh, more than likely, they'll be online, actually, I think. So I'd also like to thank uh, people who've helped me on scenes, like Kerry, uh, Sarah, and Jeremy, and all the other people. I'd like to say a big thank you to them. And finally, I think, uh, don't forget, uh, you can watch this again on our YouTube channel in a few days' time. I think the link to that will be going up on the website, I think, within the next few days. So, okay, thanks to our presenters. Thanks to you, the audience. And uh, just remains for me to wish you uh, a good night, a pleasant evening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.